got involved, we already know. We got Jason Weaver with us. What's happening? And we here, baby. It took a lot to get here, but we here. We oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> I her sisters, I think she was in the group. Yeah, yeah. She was called the Lances, or the song was called Lance, or the record company was Lance. The, um, uh, actually, the the group that my mother was in, they were called Kitty and the Haywoods. Mm -hmm. Um, they had a deal on uh, Mercury Records and uh, Capitol Records years ago, like in the. I say mid to late 70s because they were um, background singers for the longest that worked for like Curtis Mayfield, uh, the Ohio Players, uh, Tyrone Davis, a lot of classic acts from like that era, uh, early 70s to mid 70s to late 70s. Um, uh, and they eventually transitioned from that and became um, like jingle singers in the city of Chicago, my hometown. Mm -hmm. Shout out to the crib. Shout out. Um, and so basically, uh, through them working in the jingle industry consistently over the years for like, I think a total of maybe like 20 or something plus odd years, mm -hmm. uh, that gave me kind of like a, a entryway, if you will, into the industry. Into the movie uh, industry. Yeah, well first I, I started doing commercials and like print ads and uh, stuff like yeah. that because um, that was what was kind of like accessible for kids in my city initially to get in the game. So I started doing commercials first and then eventually I transitioned over into feature films when I was like nine years old. I started I started doing commercials and stuff like that at like five, six. So that's when you started the um, Kids Who um, Love Christmas? I did, I did the Kid Who Love Christmas, yeah. That was like my second film. And I did that like at 10. My first film was a film called um, The Long Walk Home with Whoopi Goldberg yeah, with Whoopi. and Sissy Space again. And then Brewster Place came. Then Brewster Place oh, came, yeah. uh, the series with Oprah. Um, and then after that, I think I did like a, a foreign film, like a French film called Miss Missouri. And then after that, uh, it was when you I did, did Jackson? the Jacksons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And how did you get that role? First of all, I want to know, how did you get in movies with Oprah? Like, and was, was she Oprah at the time? Yeah, yeah. She was and definitely. And was Whoopi, Whoopi? Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> Whoopi was one of the, and still is one of the biggest you know, stars on the planet um, and, and iconic at this point. Mm -hmm. Same with Oprah. Um, and they were really then at that stage on their ascension to becoming iconic. They were like, you know, superstar yeah, yeah. talent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but Oprah, um, she was unique in, in the way that I was able to relate um, or work with her is because she was doing a lot of stuff in the city of Chicago to provide opportunities for mm -hmm. up and coming talent. You know what I'm saying? Whether it was in front of the camera or whether it's behind the camera, she was providing opportunities, especially for people of color, black black uh, people and women, mm -hmm. uh, providing opportunities in the city to where everybody could work. So, you know, I auditioned up against other kids across the country that were like either in Los Angeles or New York or whatever, but she really wanted to make sure that she got, you know, kids from Chicago and people from Chicago involved in her production. So mm -hmm. that's how that came Oh, that out. was real, that's, that's real. Yeah. That's dead real. Now, fear, like that was from 93 to 94. Explain that, because a lot of people probably don't know. Thea was a, <laughs> a, a show that I was on on ABC uh, for one season. Uh, it was based yeah. around a comedian, uh, Thea Vidal. And uh, it was about a single black mother raising three kids in Houston, Texas. Uh, I was featured on that show alongside with Brandy, who had yet to become... You know, Brandy is uh, the superstar that she is now. Mm. Um, uh, but she was definitely on the rise uh, as a uh, as a premier vocalist. Uh, worked with Adam Jeffries on there. A lot of a lot of talented people. So we did that show for one season. Uh, but when we were on, it was like you know a favor for people mm. that watched it consistently on ABC on Wednesday, and it could it, I think it could have gone on a lot longer. Um, but unfortunately, there were just like things that were happening behind the scenes that kind of, you know, prohibited prohibited that from happening. Mm -hmm. Summertime switch. That was like right after, right? Summertime switch was right after. Uh, I think some. I did summertime switch like right after I did the uh, the Lion King. So that mm -hmm. was when I first started like my business relationship with Disney. 
Um, and I just begun to work with them like on a consistent basis throughout mm -hmm. the years after that. But Summertime Switch was a Disney movie of the week that I starred in alongside with uh, Ryder Strong. And uh, we shot it in Jacksonville, Florida. It was hella cool. It's become uh, a favorite uh, amongst people from that generation, the generation that grew up with me. Mm -hmm. uh, surprisingly to me, uh, it's become one of those like low key cult classics for people that were into, you know, Disney movie of the week then and kind of mm -hmm. grew up, you know, watching those kind of characters. So shout out to everybody that you shout know loves Summertime Switch, man. I'm glad y'all y'all dig it. And um, after that, you did your little acting thing. Well, not little, but you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not little. No, I mean, but, you know. I, and then you went back to the movie. I mean, the music industry. Yeah, I did a uh, a brief. Uh, had a brief relationship uh, with Motown Records, uh, where I had the honor and the pleasure of, of uh, establishing my relationship and working with your uncle, Mr. Mr. Rogers. Rogers. But that, no, I'm talking about Love Ambition. Yeah, Love Ambition was first. That that was on a, um, that was my debut uh, album that I put out with Motown. Uh, it was prior to Andre Harrell um, coming over to the label. I was signed by Gerald Busby, uh, rest in peace to the, legendary iconic Rest Gerald Busby peace. um so I was working with him and Steve McKeever and they were the ones that signed me to Motown I put out um a single called Love Ambition uh with them and an album called Love Ambition it was the same title uh that experienced some modern success is still considered to be like a kind of a classic uh Steppers tune in Chicago you being that you from New York you don't know what Steppers is but <laughs> Anybody from the Midwest that grew up in Chicago. So did you know Raj at that time? I didn't know Raj at that time. Oh. I, I met Roger when uh, the company was in a point of transition and they brought in Andre Harrell. And I moved from Chicago to New York um, to record what, what would have been my second uh, album. And that's when me and your uncle met. And uh, he was actually, we were paired together originally through my A&R director, Chuck Bone, uh, because I was a teenager and I didn't know anything about New York. And uh, originally, like, me and Raj just got together, just being on some French shit and him showing me around and, like, shit, you know, making sure that I understood, like, mm -hmm. the rhythm of New streets York and what was going on in the streets and the whole nine. So, of course, you know, he brought me up to 169 and 3rd Avenue, <laughs> brought me up to... Shout out, 169. Terrace. And uh, nah, that's where I met Pop and O, the whole <laughs> rest in peace to Mugshot, rest uh, in peace, Smokey, Mug. all those guys. Smokey, rest in peace. Uh, that's where I met everybody. And, um, and I was in New York for, I'd say, a year and a half working on that. It was uh, an EP, and we worked on that. And uh, at the time that we were looking to release it, uh, the actual EP, we had a single that was out that was kind of like bubbling a little bit, but... It really wasn't generating the kind of, you know, excitement that we wanted to, you know, to have on the street. And so we decided to do a remix. And it just so happened that your uncle was one of the nicest MCs on the planet. It, I think he was still Shout to out, stay. stay with me. You know what I'm saying? So we did the Stay With Me remix together um, and put that out and, and had a ball. Like, you know, we did some performances with that around the country and were able to have some really cool experiences with it. it and, you know, the, the, the project in itself... The album never came out because at that time I got smart guy. Mm. Uh, and yeah, then I, and then I asked that. for a release from Motown so that I could do that, which uh, Clarence Avon was gracious enough to to give me that release. And so, mm. uh, yeah, we, we experienced some moderate success with that Stay With Me remix single. And yeah, that was that with mm. Motown. All right, all right. Mm -hmm. Well, before Smart Guy, you was on Sister Sister. Yeah. You did a couple features on there. Did a couple features on mm -hmm. Sister Sister. Uh, shout out to Suzanne DePass and, uh, and to the Maori, uh, Maori ladies, the Maori twins, uh, and the Maori family overall. Uh, they were really instrumental in helping to... Um... Oh, my bad. You good? Yeah, I'm good. No, they were really <laughs> instrumental in helping to, um, you know, incorporate me into what they were doing with Smart Guy, with Sister Sister, so... Mm -hmm. It was an honor and a pleasure to work with them as well. Mm, and then you followed up with Moesha? Or? I didn't know. I was never on Moesha. What? No, I was never on Moesha. I, uh, 
Now, what I, what <laughs> how I was connected to Moesha was simply this: like me and Brandy have always been really good friends, and Ray J. And when we did our first when we did our first season of Smart Guy, we were on the uh, Sunset Gower lot in Hollywood. And that was a lot that pretty much all like the black shows at that time that were popping. Mm-hmm. That was a lot that we were all on. So the closest I got to being on Moesha was seeing them when we would get out and hang out together for lunch every day from yeah. our respective shows. Yeah. But shout out to the cast of Moesha. Had a, I mean, I have a lot of friends that were on there. Uh, Fredro, uh, of course, Brandy, my man Lamont, rest in peace. Uh, yeah, all those guys are really good friends. All right. We know... Small Guy was the number one show at one point in time. Mm-hmm. But what canceled the show? Um, I mean, uh, I think what 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 happened, and and hopefully your viewers will be able to um, connect with this and understand. Um, when it comes to the business of television, uh, networks are always uh, transitioning or at a point of transition when they're trying to lock in a specific demographic that they feel they're gonna be able to pull in on a consistent basis. And at that particular time, the WB was a network that was primarily driven with a black audience or an urban audience. Mm-hmm. But they knew in order for them to stay yeah, they uh, had, at like, the, the forefront. The Brothers on there. Yeah, they had the Wayans Brothers, yeah. they had the Jamie Foxx, Fox, they had yeah. us. Um, yeah, it was a lot, of, a lot of black shows or shows that were geared towards our community and demographic that helped to kickstart it. But they were beginning to see that they were reaching a broader audience when they started to uh, put out shows like Smallville and mm-hmm. you know and all the rest of the other what they would call mainstream shows uh, in certain time slots. And so I, they just made a decision based on math and based on numbers. And they knew like, okay, we want to invest this amount of money into our new fleet of shows. This one has helped us get this far, but it's time for something new. And that's just business. That's no, it's just television. But lucky for us, we were a Disney-owned show. So Disney then took the show and continued to place it on the uh, the Disney Channel. And so that's what kept it alive and what has kept it alive uh, even up till now. All right. So after you left the sitcom, even though it's still Hollywood, mm-hmm. you jumped on the drum line. Mm-hmm. What's the deal? How you get drum line? Drum line I got just uh, auditioning. You know, like everybody else, uh, I was here in Atlanta because uh, I moved down here uh, immediately after uh, Smart Guy was canceled. And uh, I started working with my family and uh, had invested in a studio had, down here. I don't here. know how to cut you off. You had any um, Nickelodeon connections? No. Uh, no, no, no. I'm I just never... thinking because I'm Nick Cannon, Drumline, and you probably had a Nick. No, 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 no. The whole thing just fell in. No, when I, when, I, when I met Nick was simply because I was already down here. Uh, Drumline was being cast. I was already uh, heavily involved with the music community down here uh, through my family, through Tricky Stewart and, uh, and Mark Stewart and a few other people that I aligned myself with down Tricky. here. Absolutely, shout out to Trick and uh, and the Red Zone crew. Mm -hmm. And uh, so through him, you know, I established a relationship with Dallas Austin. Dallas was explaining to me how he was really going to be going hard with producing major uh, or studio-backed feature films down here. That when the opportunity came, he would at least put me in a mix to where I could audition, which he did. He Mm -hmm. kept his word. I auditioned for Drumline. I was blessed enough to get cast in that. And work with some amazing people. Work with Nick, who is awesome. Um, really good friend of mine. Uh, Omar Dorsey, who went on to become, you know, in his own right, uh, a very well-respected uh, and amazingly talented actor that you all can see now on uh, Queen Sugar. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zoe Zaldana, you know, the whole crew. Working with Charles Stone as a director. Uh, and being able to work down here in Atlanta to do a... a a uh, major motion picture down here uh, was a was a treat. So, nah, thanks to to Dallas Austin for that. I did two two movies with him, but that mm-hmm. first one that we did with Drumline that was real special. And ATL was the second. We did ATL together, mm-hmm. which was also just as equally as rewarding uh, as working on Drumline. Again, it gave me an opportunity uh, to continue to work down here in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
you know, establish a, a relationship with Tip, with Lauren. Um, was he a Jack. part of um, Dallas? Also, a part of um, Lot of the Ticket? No, that was uh, that was Cube Vision. That was Ice Cube. Oh right, right. Yeah, um, he wasn't in the movie. Yeah, you and know, I, if he I got, edited, he shot it. No, absolutely. <laughs> no, then I got that. Oh, shit, I got that when I was in L.A. And then I came back down for that. But again, that gave me a yet another <laughs> opportunity to work in Atlanta. So I've been real blessed to be able to uh, to work on some great films down here. All right, so we going. I seen you in the. I, I don't know if it was BT. But well, shout-outs to Cole from Martin. You was in a movie with Cole. Yeah, we did, uh, <laughs> man, what was it called? Uh, He's Mine, Not Yours. Mm. It was like a romantic comedy, uh, an independent film. I think we did that with Swirl Films, who's also a production company that's based down here. Mm. Shout-out to Swirl Films, mm. Keith Neal, Eric Thomas Sunis, all those guys. Um, they really helped to keep the, uh, the film community thriving down here, especially when it comes to people of color and keeping uh, people of color uh, employed. So shout out to y'all. But yeah, we did that uh, together. Shout outs to them. Speaking of films down here, what you think about Tyler Perry? What I think it's think great. I think what Tyler Perry is doing is awesome. I mean, I, I respect him a great deal just on the simple fact like, you know, as a black man um, actively um, working in Hollywood um, on the level that, that he's playing at, um, I mean, nobody's ever done it yeah, before him. Uh, and again, as long as he's giving uh, legitimate opportunities to people of color mm -hmm. and allowing this community down here to thrive and to stay relevant and to make money, I'm all for it. So God bless Tyler Perry. You know what I'm saying? God bless him. That's a fact. But we're going to get back into the music. Mm -hmm. You were signed to Shakespeare. Nah, I was never oh, signed to Shakespeare. you did business with him? I did business with him. I was never signed with him mm -hmm. um, as an artist. What I did with him when I first came to Atlanta um, and then set up my production company with this producer by the name of Focus, mm. uh, who works... Uh, Shout outs to the label, too. What is it, BoobTube? BoobTube was the name of the production company. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, me and Focus, my man Dax from Compton, um, Rob, Trey, we all came down from L.A., from California, set up shop in, uh, in Triangle Sound in my cousin Tricky's studio. Mm. That's where we set up shop. And uh, from there, Shakespeare was able to recognize the level of talent and production and writing that was coming out of the room. Then gave us an opportunity to uh, to work with him and his production company in that capacity. Mm -hmm. But no, I was never signed to him as an artist, no. Oh, well, um, I got a couple personal questions. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, I got a couple personal questions. Um, it's not real personal, but you know, I heard you had a thing for Rudy from Family Matters. From uh, <laughs> Rudy from the Cosby Show? Yeah, 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 yeah. From, the, from the Cosby's. Nah, that's not true. Um, <laughs> nah, she was uh, she was already in a. Well, first of all, she was here um, at Clark Atlanta University, um, and was attending uh, was attending college. I had never seen her during that time up until I did the. Uh, the Chingy video, and at that time she was with Bob Whitfield, uh, who uh, owns Patchwork Studios, and mm. that was well so that known. Was just and, a rumor. Yeah, that was just <laughs> a rumor. I mean, no, nah, because although like I think Keisha's hella cool, like I've never had that kind of relationship with her in that sense, to where I was like, where I was trying to get with her. But she's hella cool. We worked on one call away together. She, I still regard her as a, a good friend still. Much love to Keisha, but yeah. There's no truth to that. <laughs> <laughs> we ain't gonna talk about it. Um, but um, why you stop doing movies and sitcoms? Like, like was, it was a point in your life where you just said, like, "Nah." I mean, well, the thing is, I haven't stopped. Like, I'm, I'm actually featured on Boomerang on season two now. Mm -hmm. That's coming on BT. You wanna hear about all um, that? And I'm, pr I'm producing a couple animated, uh, animated shows. One with Comedy Central. Uh, called The Secret Society that I'm doing with Antonio Reed Jr., L.A. Reed's son, and I have another uh, another show called Team Supreme uh, that I'm co-producing alongside with Joshua Leonard and uh, my sister Lena Way mm -hmm. at her production company Hillman Grad. So no, nah, I, I think uh, I think where people may no you. They just thought you just probably left and focused on music because you know you can't focus on both. No, I mean I think uh, <laughs> I, just... I think what it is is 
people probably can be selective, like as far as what what they see you in. Because some mm -hmm. people look at certain genres of film, um, or they may I don't know look at a certain channel, whatever. But no, as far as working consistently as an actor, um, I still do it. I think I'm a little bit more reluctant to just jump into anything. Yeah, nowadays. you always said that. I remember years ago. Yeah, you were supposed to do a gay. They offered you a gay role, and we was like, "I'm not doing a gay role." Wait, if yeah. my son grow up and watch that gay role, well, it's it's not, <laughs> it, and, it, and it's not, it's not, it wasn't even coming, it wasn't coming from that perspective when I um, turned down the role. The mm. what I turned down was how the character was going to be represented. I wasn't mad. Answer. I wasn't mad at the character being gay, but. That that character has to have a story. It just can't be some flamboyant character. No, I that, think it, I that, think it was that, actually kissing a man or something. You was like, oh hell no. Well, no, I mean that that's a that's a personal move like that I that I won't make. But even past that, it went deeper than that. Mm -hmm. Like, cause even if someone offered me a role, um, a gay role now, and said, hey man, would you be willing to play this? Th to be honest with you, the story in, in which that character had it had to be told in a very respectful way. That had to be told in a way where I wouldn't feel uncomfortable with, with representing it mm -hmm. and showing it. So from that standpoint, when I turned down that role, it was because I felt that they were going to present the character stereotypically. And I felt that the way that they were going to present the character as a black man being gay yeah, um, would have been more detrimental and counterproductive. And to shout out to the gay community, too. Nothing against the gay community. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, I'm just, no but I'm just I'm simply yeah, clarifying yeah. because I think it's important that people know that, especially when it comes to actors. And when you do turn down a, a particular role, like I'm a real actor, like yeah. if you put a real role in front of me, whether he's gay, straight or whatever, if it's a meat up, like on the bones, no pun intended, but if it's a, if it's a meat there on the bones for me to like, you know, chew and, and, and really show my range as an actor, I will try it. But you're not just going to have me coming on screen misrepresenting myself or misrepresenting a group of people that you're looking to represent. Mm. I'm not gonna be that guy that's gonna be the fall guy for that. Mm. So yeah, that's where I was coming from with that. <clears throat> All right, we got that out the way. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what you were shooting Sunday. You had a little um, Yeah, I was uh, uh, set shooting Sunday, Sunday. a good friend of mine, an independent filmmaker down here by the name of Danley Wyatt, uh, AKA Prowler Man, who I think is just uh, an overall creative genius. He uh, does these this web series called Larry Dickum, uh, which is kind of like this exaggerated uh, '70s black black exploitation esque character that he created. And um, in one of the episodes, he wrote uh, a role in there for me to you know for us to clown around and to do something creative together. So we shot that here mm -hmm. uh, in Alpharetta at my boys' spot, Chad and Blizz. Shout out to Chad and Blizz, the whole crew at Cordell's here. Um, yeah, we shot like a short, uh, short film that we're gonna put out, um, and you know, hopefully it'll go viral, and and we'll see. But Prowl is one of my business partners and, and one of my creative partners that I collaborate with uh, from time to time. That I I just think is a, I just think he's a creative genius, and if given the opportunity, especially in the trajectory and in the way by which I'm going now with producing and developing content, hopefully. Uh, we'll Shout out to Mr. Rogers. Oh, that's Raj. Raj Cole. We <laughs> here on what up, live Raj? on the podcast. <laughs> oh, nothing, man. We here doing this interview right yeah. now, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> nah, nah, we good. So we we doing it now. We we wrapping it up now. So yeah. we'll we'll hit you once we done. I tell you, I tell you, Mr. Rogers. That was making Mr. sure Rogers. everything is cool. Yeah. Right on time, too. Absolutely. Shout out to Bottle Ball, Jay Reed, Big Man, Baby, Gabe Reed. Holla at me, 